want to continue the theme of being an effective student, an effective learner. And it's all about understanding yourself. Because we are all different, as I keep saying, and that means we all learn in different ways. And what I'm going to ask you about today is a whole set of questions that are aimed to help you to understand how you actually learn most effectively. Because now that you're at university, you have the responsibility, and you alone, to do the learning. I can't learn for all of you. I can't learn for any individual one of you. Learning is about yourself. And as I keep, will keep, will keep uh, mentioning, the most important way that I can help you is to provide you with sets of questions and not to give you answers. If I give you an answer, you stop learning, because you know it. But I'm going to give you questions which you need to think about for yourself. And there's about eight or ten different sorts of questions that I'm going to cover this afternoon. How many of you have English as a second language or a parallel first language? Anybody? Quite a number of you, yeah. So we'll have a little look at what it means to study in English in an English university compared with the sorts of play, uh, schools that you have uh, been brought up in other countries. We'll want to have a little look at different cultural attitudes towards studying. And as a quick introduction to this, in many parts of the world, by the time you get to university, you are still effectively rote learning. You have to just listen to what the lecturer says, the professor. You read the chapters of the book that they give you, and that's all. And all you have to do in an exam is to then work out what the question means and then which bit of a lecture or a book or a chapter of a book you need to regurgitate perfectly. That does not apply here in the UK and in Europe, and mostly does not apply in the USA and North America. So it's a very, very different approach. What we're looking for here <coughs> is that you understand the subject. And with that understanding, <coughs> you know then how to apply your knowledge in any particular context, and that's why questions are so valuable. Because it makes you understand that every context is different, and therefore you need to find a different solution or a different answer in every context. And then we'll look a little bit at how we learn, and that finally leads on to how you plan your time as a student here in the University of Derby to make the most effective use of those many hours that you have for each module during the week. Now it's based on a book by Lowes et al, and you'll see the details at the back of the um, presentation in a little bibliography. And I would strongly recommend those of you who have English as a second language or who come from the fact-based, rote learning type of culture find out how we study here in the UK. Really valuable. I'll be looking at stuff that comes from chapter two today. <coughs> so someone who is going to be an effective learner is someone who is motivated. They know why they want to be here. They know why they're going to get value out of spending a lot of money on a university education. They are also people who understand how to study for themselves, not based on how other people learn, but how I, that's all of you saying I, learn individually. 
and you are also independent. That means you don't keep coming and saying, can I, or should I, or may I, or asking lots and lots of questions when the answer has already been given to you. I've already noticed at various ear levels, particularly for the new people in the university, people keep coming and saying, Richard, what have I got to do for the assignment or the article? And it's not just some of you guys, it's lots of others. And the answer is already there in the assignment specification. And I just have to go and show, okay, I highlight this, this is what the answer to your question is. Just go and read it. And if we give you guidance to go and look, at, look for something, do a bit of research, then an independent, motivated learner will go and do that. Because that is where you're going to learn the answer for yourself. Because if we give you the answer, you forget it almost instantly. But if you work through it yourself, because of that hard labour, you will actually remember it. And this comes up and is reinforced by that uh, book I think I mentioned last week, Thinking Fast and Slow, by Daniel Kahneman. And he points out that the learning process where you work through stuff is actually quite hard brain effort. And you can actually measure oxygen consumption going up when people are doing learning by this approach. Which implies energy is being used to lay down new connections in the synapses of the brain. So if we're feeling lazy, we aren't actually going to put that effort in. We aren't going to work through the exercises or do the research or build the bibliography to Harvard standards as you're do doing all the research which you're supposed to be doing at the moment for your article. <coughs> it's the lazy approach that does quick, grab the URL, pop it into the uh, working bibliography. Quick. Cap the next one, cap the next one, put it in. Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. The harder work, which will teach you how to um, reinforce your learning about how to create Harvard standard reference lists, well, if you don't want to waste that or use that oxygen to do that, it will reflect in all the rest of your assignments through your career here. And so it's better to do the exercise now as you're capturing those references now. That's part of being motivated, knowing how to study, and being um, independent. If we look at page 15 of the book, there are a whole set of questions that you need to be able to answer effectively. You need to know the answers to every single one of those questions. Because they're effectively questions. Do you like your course? Do you know what your aim is in being here? Because if you don't know why you are here, you need to think very carefully about whether it is worth spending £9,000 a year just on your fees and another several thousand a year on your living expenses? Does every, do all of you know what your major aim is in life to being here at the university? Hands up if you do know. Most of you, but there are still a sort of biggish handful who don't know why you are here. You need to start thinking very, very carefully about that one before you've invested too much in being here in terms of time, money, emotional effort, and everything else. It's critical that you know what your aim of studying actually is. Now, how many of you have an aim to get a good job with a big high salary? How many of you have the aim that you want to do something that you can be really good at and happy at? 
that's somewhat better. <coughs> Having a career objective of a large fat salary is not actually going to make you happy. Having a job in which you are happy is much more important than a huge 100,000 a year type salary. I mean, it's kind of nice. But if you're not happy, you've got 40 years of that ahead of you, at least. And many of you are not going to retire at 65, you're probably going to go on to 70, most likely, or near that. And to be unhappy for the next 45 to 50 years, to me, is probably not the right motive. How many of you actually know, really, how to study effectively? Well, we'll so solve that one, hopefully, a bit today. <coughs> how many of you understand the situation and the way in which you actually study best? Not many. I'm glad some of you do. Again. Towards the end of this presentation, there will be some clues and some tests you can take that will help you to understand yourself better. How many want to have a nice, easy time? What's encouraging? Ah, oh, no. That was less encouraging to see even one or two hands go up. So how many of you are prepared to work really, really hard? I guess those are the ones who already know what their topic is for the article and have got some good re uh, research already under your belt so we can start thinking about the structure tomorrow in the workshop sessions. How many of you like working by yourself and not being bothered by having other people around you working on your project? So. Broadly, that means those who just have put their hand up don't really want to work effectively with other people around you. Is that true? How many don't want to work effectively with others? Well, we are all individuals um, and we're all different, so we expect some to want to work by themselves and sometimes it's really important. But one of the things that business and businesses keep telling universities across the Western world is that one of the skills that is absolutely vital to getting a good job is to be able to collaborate with other people in the team. It's a very, very important one. And you will have the IT team project or uh, the team project in the second year. And that will help you to begin to understand some of those things that are going to be really important. Because if you can't work together with other people, it's going to be difficult to find a job that you can actually work with, other than be self-employed. And even then, it could be difficult. <coughs> Time management. Now, this is something that humans have a problem with, by and large, worldwide. But do you know how, for yourself, you can manage your time most effectively to get the most studying and work done. Hands up, those who know how to have time manage. <coughs> yeah, it's a skill that takes a little while to develop, and so we'll try and give you some pointers over the next few two or three years to help you begin to develop that ability. Now, all of the modules, there will be a lecturer who is the module leader, and you may have one or more of our, my colleagues who are the tutors on that, that course. So, for example, those doing Programming 1 tomorrow, you will have about three or four people as tutors in your workshop on Programming 1. Do you know, do you think you know, how best to get the maximum value out of your tutors in all of your workshops, your lectures, <coughs> and all those other things, not formal seminars and lectures. How many of you know how to get the best out of us, out of me? Okay. 
finding and using resources. Well, net tomorrow, you know, this is reinforcing that, where you're researching to find resources you can use as evidence for your, uh, your article that you're writing for me. How many of you know how to go, what you can do in the library? How to find useful books and other sources there, to find the skilled advisors there? Maybe you need to think about going to the library and asking what things they could help you with, where the various skills resources are, because you can get the skills resources on the website in Udo, or you can get it in various parts of the library building. Probably a very good idea to start thinking about going there. Who wants to find out about careers advice? Go to the library, there are career advisors there. They have tests that they can give that you can take <coughs> to help find out what your aptitudes are. And how many of you have even thought of looking at the students' rights and responsibilities, the three R's? <coughs> One or two people. I would suggest very strongly that you all Go and find those on the university website to find out what your rights are as students, but also, and just as important, your responsibilities as a student. You see, one of the things about what's happened in the West over the last 20, 30 years is rights have become keynotes. I have rights, and you mustn't trample on my rights. You feel that? You've seen that? You understand that a bit? But the interesting thing is that with rights come responsibilities. And the one area where I have found that really interesting has been when I was teaching down in Southern Africa uh, two or three times a year. And one of the things I discovered from my students in places like Malawi, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and down into Botswana, is that the traditional life comes with some very, very strong rights and responsibilities within the extended family. And those rights and responsibilities of the extended family in almost the whole of sub-Saharan Africa are what actually makes those countries work. As they get more westernized and keep to the rights and forget their responsibilities, to the rest of their family. And that can mean, for example, one person with a good job, a professional white collar job, may be actually supporting 10, 20, 30, 40 family members. And I look at that and say, wow, that is an amazing thing to see when we in Britain, we in America, and our friends and colleagues in the States, and many, much of Europe, all we have is our nuclear family, husband, wife, mother, father, and two, three children. And we lock down to that tiny, tiny area of responsibility. And that means we have lost an amazing part of our life that we had here a few hundred years ago. But Africa still has it. And I take my hat off to African countries where that is still the case, because it makes so much sense and I'd like you to think about your rights as students along with your responsibilities in terms of studying, doing that hard work. Because if you can do that, you will become both a great student and a great employer, employee, potentially a great employer, as you develop through your career. So, that's what knowing the requirements of my institution are. They're to do with rights and responsibilities. We don't have time for me, because we didn't have a two hour session which I had when I was doing this originally with small groups. I don't have time for each of you to have these five minute sessions, but I want you, as part of your responsibilities, tonight or during the week, to download this presentation and ask yourselves these questions. Buy the book by Lowe's et al. 
down in the uh, bookshop downstairs, but down here, particularly if you're an overseas student. And then go through the exercise and go through all of the chapters. But you need to know the answers individually for every single one of those questions on that last chart. A summary of the universal U, uh, UK type of responsibilities for students. And there are more and more explicit ones in the rights and responsibilities of students from the University of Derby. Because if you do all of these things, you will succeed. If you want to find out, or I take the article, which week is it due in? How many know the answer? Hands up. How come there are so few hands up? How many of you have actually looked at yourself the assignment specification for this module? Uh, most hands. There are still a few hands which haven't, so I suggest you go find it afterwards and find out the date. I mean, I have told you several times, but um, you should know from reading it. Well, at least you know how to hand it in, to turn it in, because you practiced that a couple of weeks ago. So that's not difficult. You won't know yet when your exam or your computer-based test for part two of, this, uh, of the assessment is it will be sometime in the first two weeks, roughly, of January. And that will be published both on the university website in a few weeks' time, and by Amanda, she will notify you when and where. <coughs> Basically, the where will be all of the computer labs, our specialist computer labs, uh, the date has not yet been set, but you need to keep your eye open for it because we always have two or three people who miss the exam because they, oh, I didn't see the notification. Now, all of you have a uni mail address, don't you? How many of you check that every day? <coughs> How many of you have set up a redirector, a forwarder, so it forwards from Unimail onto your personal Gmail account? I think you need to think carefully about how you're going to stay in contact with us because we use announcements and we normally will email those announcements out of Blackboard to every single one of you at your Unimail address. Your uni mail address is an incredibly valu valuable uh, piece of um, information because that is what proves to the outside world that you are a student at the University of Derby. That gets, sets, gives you some credentials. It is also the easiest way of communicating back to us from your uni mail address so that A, it avoids our spam blockers and our junk mail folders, so we get it. If you use your Gmail account, the likelihood is we will miss it. It may well go into our spam folders or junk mail folders, or we just see it as a random um, person trying to contact <coughs> us, and it goes to the bottom of our to look at list. But use your email account every time you want to con contact us, and make sure that your Unimail messages are visible to you easily on a daily basis, as often as you look at your normal Gmail account. <coughs> Always be ready to ask questions if you don't understand something. One of the signs of a good learner, of a really excellent learner, is that you will ask questions. Just because you think it's embarrassing that you haven't understood this doesn't mean to say you're the only person who doesn't understand. Or maybe everybody around you doesn't understand. And the lecturer, that's me, may not have explained it in ways that you can actually understand. In which case, you need to put your hand up, stop me in my tracks, and ask me to explain it again in different words. It's really important that you always are able, feel able to ask questions of un 
understanding, and so on. Because otherwise you won't learn. And the last responsibility you have is your help. Your personal help. I know as students, we often like to sort of burn the candle at both ends. We like particularly to have a good evening and then come back and try and do some studying and writing assignments and essays at sort of 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock at night. I've been there, I've done it. <coughs> but it doesn't mean to say that it's a good way of doing things. Unless, going back two or three slides, that time, one at midnight to say 3 o'clock, is a time that you actually do some of your best work. If that is the case, then you need to know for certain that that's when it's best to do the work. Don't just do it accidentally because things happen. Plan your life around a really good knowledge of yourself. But you need to stay healthy all the way through your life. That means you need to understand how to be healthy and then to do the things that keep you healthy. Now, some people, and Margaret Thatcher, an ex-Prime Minister of the UK, is known to have thrived on four hours of sleep a night. Okay, if you know for a fact that four hours of sleep a night is adequate, great. But if really you know that you need six, eight, ten hours of sleep a day or night, and then you give yourself four hours of sleep a night, you're going to get ill. It can trigger all sorts of unexpected consequences. It can trigger diabetes. No one knows quite why. It can trigger you to have, be much, much more likely to catch colds and things that keep you away from your lectures. It can do all sorts of things. So find out what is right for you so that you can keep your health under control and you keep yourself in good health. Really, really important. Again, the same sort of thing between now and next week, next Monday, go through those questions and see what you know about your responsibilities. See how, much of the, how many of those questions you actually can answer positively. You know what the answers to all of these things. If you don't know the answers, go find out. If you don't know how to keep yourself healthy, go see your doctor or go and talk to the well-being people here in the University of Derby. They will help you identify what's best, what's necessary for you. And I see there's a leaflet going around at the moment about sleeping well. Oh yeah, last question there is, what are the statements which are true for you, but then think about what are the consequences if you don't do those things. Rights, responsibilities, and then consequences. We said that a, an effective learner is a motivated student, or a motivated person. So, You need to understand for yourself whether you are more motivated by those external things like getting good marks, getting praise, having that sort of feeling that you are approved of by your lecturer, your tutor, your boss, your parents, your friends. Is your motivation getting a good job? Is it money? Or do you get the most motivation from those internal things? The fact that you've got this great sense of achievement. I've done something really great. I don't really care what other people think about it. But I care about it myself. <coughs> and do you gain pleasure from all of this hard work, this studying, finding out new things, finding out the way the world works, finding out how programs work, how security works, how computer forensics works, or analytics. 
Now, I'm not going to ask you to put, a, put your hands up about intrinsic or external because we are all different, and this is a very, very private aspect. <clears throat> However, one thing that is interesting <coughs> is that once you get into the world of business and you're employed, very often the manager will make one single assumption that you are motivated by the pay that you get, the rewards you get, and those annual progressions. That may not be a correct assumption. In all of my life, and now I've been in business, worked at work for something like 40, over 40 years, I know of only, I can remember only one manager who has ever asked me, what is it, Richard, that motivates you? Only one manager, and I have had, at Rolls-Royce, I had one, a new manager pretty much every 18 months I moved on and on. And it was interesting that none of those managers ever explicitly asked me what motivated me. But we each individually need to know what motivates us and then work out how we can get those factors into our life so that we get this feeling of motivation. I want to carry on studying, I want to do better, I want to get that job, I want to get that job. Or I want to be able to go, for me perhaps, to that conference, because. And you always need to know the because. So think about your motivation. Because they are what is going to keep you going for the next three, not three to four years. And then on further into your life. Now to help you with this, you need to do some of these things. Write down what is it that motivates you in life? What is it that's going to be motivating you for the next three years in your academic study? Is it just money? A good job? The approval of your parents, of your friends, your siblings, your brothers and sisters. What is it that really motivates you? And then, are they these internal or external, intrinsic or extrinsic factors? And then you need to think about, as a group discussion, you know, with your friends. We can do it tomorrow, if you like, in the workshops, uh, as a, a short session. Think about the question, which form of motivation ultimately is the one that uh, leads to the most effective individual responsibility for learning? A lot of what we're covering in these sessions on the Monday afternoon are going to be topics where you are going to learn, or capable of learning a lot, about yourself, which will help you with studying and ultimately getting good jobs and in work. So this set is all about understanding yourself really clearly. I never got this back at, when I was a student. No university bothered about these things. You just came to university to be taught. We are getting much more interested in understanding how people learn and helping people to understand themselves so they can become good students and good employees. And that's what these are all about. Now, many of you did UK um, A-levels or the uh, equivalents, and many of those of you from overseas have done things like maybe A-levels and so on. Now the question is, were you taught everything by your teacher, or were you just given an outline, a context, and then you had to go and learn by yourself from the resources at which your teacher pointed you? How many were taught everything? How many were given the sort of questions and then told, go find the, uh, the information? Some of each and none, which is kind of interesting. I must have missed out something there. Do tell me later on. Now, what you will be doing here is much more 
the second of those two options. Much of what you will learn for yourselves in the field of computer science, by which I mean everything that all of you are here for, is changing so fast <coughs> that there's no point in memorizing much of it. Understand the principles the, and the way things work. But what you need to be thinking about individually, again, are those four questions. When you were studying before you came here, what did you like about the way you learnt? What were the things about that way you learnt made it difficult for you individually? Did you enjoy it? But then the killer. What is it? each of you actually helps you to learn. And that is the most important thing that comes out of this slide, understanding yourself. Because you need to harness that through your motivation, your independent learning, to be able to succeed here. Think about how you were studying last year or the year before that, or some while ago, if you had went to school last year or the year before. Did those methods you used previously to learn, did they help you, or did you just kind of bumble through and it wasn't terribly successful, or you weren't terribly successful? So, in order to learn from the past, you need to understand it. And to understand it, you need to do this exercise. Write down the approach that you use. That just records and captures and describes what you did. That's helpful as long as you then go on and critically evaluate, comment upon, was it useful? Why was it useful? And what could be done better? What could you do better to learn better? And are those approaches where you just, particularly those where you just sat and listened and made a few notes, because that's what the teachers wanted you to do, are they relevant today at university? <coughs> But now, the journey forwards. What sort of ways of learning do you actually like? What ways don't you like? What ways are effective for you? <coughs> Two URLs that you will find very, very interesting. Go to both of those. The first one will help you to understand the broad way that you like to learn. And then the second one will help you more as a test and as a second way of working out who you are and how you learn. <coughs> Interesting ways. I mean, the stuff there will t tell you things that you didn't know about learning. Then you need to think about time. Now, I know that if I am sat at a screen marking or sat with lots of a big heap of um, assignments to mark, somewhere in the afternoon between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock is not a good time for me to do that. Whether my blood sugar levels are low or what happens, I start off on an assignment and then half an hour later, I'm still there on that assignment. So I know that if I want to mark assignments, I don't do it between sort of 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock. I do it at some other time of the day when I know that I'm effective and I don't sort of drift off into random thoughts or dozing or something. So you need to know <coughs> whether you are like to get up early and study. I mean, I used to have a whole lot of students down in sub-Saharan Africa in Sadek. And as middle managers, they would often get up at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning to get their studying done. Not many of them did it in the evening because that wasn't when they could study. 
So do you like getting up early or do you like getting up, staying up late? I don't care which you like. What I do care about is that you know very clearly because you have asked yourself about it and you thought about it to work out when it's best. And then plan your diary around that. Plan your work activities, your studying activities, the times that you write your assignments, the times that you do your research around whether you're an early bird or a, a night owl. And that has to do with when you're most alert, when your energy levels are high. Those are the times you need to learn about for yourself. Now, I get into trouble here from some of my colleagues in education because this particular bit, the VARC test, they say, oh, Richard, that's out of date. It's long ago. We don't believe in it anymore. However, when you go to the bottom link, the VARC test link, you will learn something about yourself. <coughs> You'll go there and there's about 20, I can't remember, 20 or 40 questions, and then you submit it actually into a bit of growing database. So they can understand the proportions of people who like different ways of studying. Are you someone who likes to see things? VAR, V for visual. A for auditory, you like listening. Uh, R. That one I forget. K is for kinesthetic, you like moving around. And you can see as I move all the time, I speak with my arms, my hands. I like studying or learning and teaching <coughs> by movement. Now, we're all different and we actually will respond well to various combinations. But you need to understand. So do you want to learn stuff from reading or do you want to do YouTube? As long as you choose the right YouTubes. The reputable ones. That have a, are created by people with a good reputation. You see, you can learn programming from several directions. You can do it from reading the manual that's how I and Dave Voorhees learned our many languages which we've learned over the years. From the reference manuals that tell you the language, the syntax, and the grammar. Others like to use the dummies book for C Sharp or Java or whatever. Others learn from videos, the how-to videos that are available by the score these days. Those of you who are doing BSCIT, you'll be learning SAS by hands-on actually doing it. You'll learn how to use Watson Analytics for students almost entirely from videos on the IBM and shortly the um, University of Derby websites uh, and YouTube playlists. That's where it all is. And so you'll learn your strengths and your weaknesses through that second link. <clears throat> and planning. We talked a bit about time management. We talked a little bit about understanding the time of day that you're most effective for studying and for writing and thinking and reading. And they may be different times of the day, by the way. Once you know all of those things about yourself, then you can start building your work plan. Now, the first thing, obviously, is the things that are built in, lectures, workshops, seminars, and so on. In this semester, or this year, typically about 12 hours a week per module, uh, for the program, sorry. Could be a little higher. And then you have another nine and a half hours a week per module that you should be spending time studying researching, writing, and so on. Now, your question then becomes,
do I allocate that, those nine hours a week for each module? So you end up with 38 hours roughly of study time a week. Do you allocate them on short one hour blocks for ICS and so on? Or is it better to have a longer period, two or three hours per module, so you can really get stuck in? For each of you, the answer will be different. I would suggest you don't go down below about an hour a week, because otherwise you get an hour per session, because otherwise your context switching, those of you who are going through the sort of programming and, and ICS with Amanda, will probably be uh, learning about multitasking operating systems, which switch context when a flag goes up. So I need to do this, or switch from this program to that program or the other program. Now humans have can't switch context as effectively as electronic computers can. And it can be five, 10 minutes before you back up to speed every time you switch context. So think about, is an hour okay, or should it be two hours? Or 45 minutes, or do you need 45 minutes, a 10 minute break, and then back onto the same thing again, but not switching to a different module? You need to think about where are you going to study. You're going to do it in your home, your room, in your halls of residence, in the computer specialist labs, or the general access PC, or in the library with books and paper. These are all different choices that each of you has to make explicitly for yourself. Just because your friend is doing this, doesn't mean it'll work for you. And then write down your plan and try to keep it. Now the only problem is, we all know in project management that the publishing your plan, that plan is only accurate at the point in time that you publish it. Things happen and that will kind of divert you from the plan. That's reality, guys. But the plan at least can help you to focus your study at the most effective times. And that's the book. Lowe's, Peters and Turner. Yeah, it was published in 2004. The principles <coughs> in it are still relevant, even though it is 13 years old. It's an amazing book. And it will help everybody, not just the international students, but also all of you who came, grew up in the UK and went through the UK school system. It will help you, all of you. And as I say, there are many copies in the library and that you can probably still buy, you can certainly order it off Amazon or from the bookshop downstairs. Thank you very much, folks. I'll see you again uh, tomorrow.